Special thanks to the Texas General Land Office's Save Texas History program, educating Texans of all ages about our colorful past. Go to SaveTexasHistory.org for more information. I'm Janine Plummer, and I own Austin Ghost Tours, and I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as ghosts as you believe them to be. From the front door, I saw this figure walk across the porch. I have never experienced anything quite like this before, but the fact of the matter is, it's on my recording device. Haunted Texas travels across Texas to uncover the truth behind unexplainable events and explore the history of the land and its people. Today, we're in Peyton Colony, Texas. On this episode of Haunted Texas, we explore the rich history and lingering spirits of a small rural community in Blanco County. In 1865, following emancipation, former slaves created self-sustained communities. This is Peyton Colony, nine miles east of the town of Blanco. Oh, the pale light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. There were 250,000 ex-slaves following the war between the states. A handful of these people were determined to own their own land. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm with Mr. Lawrence Coffey, yeah. and where are we? In Mount Hill Baptist Church. Where? Downtown Peyton Colony. How long have you lived here? 69 years. We were, we were yeah. off Peyton Colony Road. Yeah. Is that house still there? No, because we was, I was born in a one, one room shack, you know, just made out of one single board. boy with a fireplace. What was your life like? You go to school, you work. You know, we went and picked cotton till December. Then we come home and then that's when we started the school, right before Christmas. It was lots of work. When we started out, my dad, before we were born, they bought like a hundred acres, and each, each family was granted so much land. To find out how ex-slaves obtained land in Texas following emancipation, Haunted Texas checked the National Archives, the Blanco Library, and went to the Texas General Land Office. We discovered that when Texas joined the Union in 1846, it retained ownership of its public lands. One way to get land was through a preemption grant, which required a person to improve claimed land for three years before filing for the deed of title. Residency was usually proven by using neighbors as witnesses. That's exactly what Peyton Roberts did. This is the preemption grant issued to Peyton Roberts in August of 1871, where it says that he is the settler on the property and we're staking a claim, and then we have a document three years later that Peyton Roberts comes back and again says, I've occupied this land, I've made improvements, I now would like to have title to the land. We see he had two other witnesses, one of which is James H. McCrocklin. His father, Jesse L. McCrocklin, was a slave owner. He owned four slaves, and it's not hard to imagine that a group of former slaves settling on their own property on a piece of Texas may not have been very popular with the local neighbors, which is why it's surprising that the son of a former slave owner is helping Peyton Roberts and his friends start this freedman's colony immediately adjacent to their property. So after staking their claim on the land outside of Blanco, 
the group of new Texans returned to where they'd come from in Caldwell County and fulfilled the agreement made with the plantation owner that if they stayed on and worked through the harvest, they would each receive a wagon, a mule, a plow, a cow, a hog, some chickens, and a dog to start their farms. I read about him, you know, coming in from uh, Lockhart, and he'd come here and work. And then the story reads that he moved back to the landowner, and then the following year, well, the landowner came with him and helped him get started. Some of the original founding family's names were Coffee, Upshaw, Hardin, including Peyton Roberts, who was the first of the founders to die in 1888 at the age of 45. All that's left today of Peyton Colony is the old graveyard, the schoolhouse, the church, and apparently the spirits of those who passed away. The center of every rural town in Texas is the church. It is the place where people gathered in celebration or in mourning. They would gather together if a family was in need. It was a place of community. Well, my mother would always make us be here in time for Sunday school. And then she would get here by 11 o'clock for 11 o'clock service and she would bring the meal. Because when church turned out under the big oak trees, we'd have a meal. Peyton Colony families first met for Sunday church outdoors until George Upshaw donated land for the new place of worship. A log cabin was built, but even with a new roof over their heads, the family still gathered outdoors after church for their Sunday meal. The land is where it all started. And then at 12 o'clock, you'll see people coming in because they know it was getting time to eat. They'd serve it, put it all out there on the table. I was but now I the church was also a place Peyton Colony children first met to study. Then in 1877, Peyton Colony Schoolhouse was built. The original building still stands today. Peyton Roberts was illiterate. He could not sign his name, so in the document, it allows him to make his mark. And when you look at the, the document signed by George Coffey, who was the son of Boney Coffey, another early colony settler, we can tell George Coffey is signing his own name. Given the size of the signature, this is a very proud signature. And that school educated the next generation of colony residents, and he was educated at the Peyton Colony Schoolhouse. All the kids, they walked from about two miles. Eight o'clock, we had to be at school and ready to go to school. One room, we had one teacher, you know, she taught everybody. We had one heater, little deal like this for the library with old books is what we had to study. Tell me the story of the bell and your father. The bell was like a telephone. Different rings meant different things. If some family had a problem, well, they would come to the church and ring the bell. We was out there in the yard playing. And when he heard this bell ring, he jumped in his car, which was a Model A, and he come down and he found out that our auntie had passed. Like many rural communities, the young people moved away. As new families began to purchase the original Peyton Colony homesteads, strange visions on the property began to emerge. So Haunted Texas decided to investigate. We've always heard stories about rumors about ghosts in this area. Of course, I didn't really believe any of it until my brother, his friend and he were having a picnic down by our creek and they saw about 30 cloaked figures in different colored cloaks walking down the creek. And my brother didn't know what to think because they'd never seen anything like this before. And so they went and told my dad who was working in one of our greenhouses. This piece of property has been farmed for probably 150 years. 
We're able to buy 30 acres out here. Thought we'd want to put greenhouses up and then found out I had good soil, so we started farming. And well, we turned up all sorts of things around here. Bits and pieces of tools, various little bottles, little porcelain dolls. But the real prize is an 1863 penny. We are on the Arnosky family farm, which is actually land that was Peyton Colony. This fence was built at the end of the Civil War when the freed slaves inherited the property. And you can see that the ground level on this side of the fence is um, a lot lower than the other side. It's actually level on the other side. And that's from the erosion since the Civil War. And these walls line the road all the way 10 miles to Blanco from Wimberley into town. The Arnosky family bought land within the Peyton Colony almost 20 years ago. It seems some farmer residents choose to remain. When we first moved out here, it was just solid cedar. It had been abandoned for about 30 years. And we cut our way in with a chainsaw and pitched a tent, started building a little cabin. And when we got the cabin built, for the first three or four years, there was one window facing east, facing the creek. When you pass that window, oftentimes, you get a pretty clear glimpse of an older black man that would walk right past the window. And we'd always turn and look, and you'd just see the glimpse shoot by. And I finally mentioned it to my wife, Pamela, and she says, well, I've been seeing that all along too, but she never mentioned it to me. We talked to neighbors in the area, they have exactly the same experience of an older man walking past their window. The haunted Texas crew set out with infrared cameras and specialized audio equipment just after sunset at the Arnosky farm. We would move into an area. Uh -huh. Vigil. Kind of stand a little bit, you just talk a little bit, and then we would all become still. And then get up and maybe walk a little bit to see if anything follows us. Usually it does. My name is Dennis Foley. I'm an audio recording specialist for Haunted Texas. I'm also a field recording engineer with over 20 years of professional experience. As a professional, I use extremely high-end audio recording gear. What I've got in my hands right now is something called the Marantz PMD670, and it's a digital recording device. Once you attach a microphone to it, it feeds sound into the device and records it onto something called a compact flash card. It actually gives you a lot of functionality in this area here to process your sound a bit. The way I like to use this machine is to flatline all of that. In other words, I apply no processing when I am recording. So whatever's being recorded into this device is exactly the source material that's coming down from the microphone itself. This is uh, what's called a shotgun microphone. It records or it gathers sound in what's called a hypercardioid pattern, which is a very directional pattern for sound. So whatever I point this at, it will gather that sound in that direction. That's not to say it's not recording sound on the sides, but what it's specifically going after is what it's pointed at. You'll see me with a very large device called a Zeppelin that's covering the entire microphone. And that's just to prevent any sort of wind activity from affecting the sound quality that we really want to record. I wonder if we get close to the house, there was some activity over near the house. We chose two locations to investigate. First, the location where the cowboys often seen. I was just sitting there watching TV and I saw something, somebody walk by and I was thinking, there's nobody here. Why would somebody be walking by? And I looked out and I could not find anything. While we were just on the porch, there's something clothing, something that you couldn't really make out in the dark, hanging on a line. And as Janine was talking, it started rocking and it wasn't like wind, there was no wind. And then it stopped. We walked the Arnosky driveway where another spirit had been seen. When my brother was around 12, he was sitting in our upstairs loft and looking out the top window. It was about nine in the morning. He saw this female figure walking up the driveway. It looked like she was in a wedding dress and he got distracted for when my mom called for breakfast and he looked down the loft and he looked back and the figure was gone. And then a few years later, my sister, about two in the morning one night, she woke up and she looked out her window and she saw the same figure he had and she was a glowing figure at the end of the driveway. Next to the old rock wall along the Blanco to Wimberley Road, if we talked about what life was like during those first years of freedom, would the spirits come around? 
this fence was built by amazing hardworking people. For sure, there was a lot of challenge. I just feel like the people that lived and worked around Peyton Colony were really, really proud. We are sitting on the old road between Blanco and Wimberley. This road that runs straight to Blanco and it's lined with the rock walls. The freed slaves who farm this land use the rocks that they gathered from the fields to build the rock walls, to separate their boundaries, and when they did have animals, to keep their animals inside. I can tell you they're here right now really powerfully. And when I say they, I think that there's a definite energy because I am really warm and it's really cold. Yeah, I just said the same thing. Did I'm you? I'm feeling yeah. heat at the tips of my fingers and around the chest. Around my chest. I feel really warm. Okay, so we, something just happened again. What the heck just happened? I heard a shh. I heard that too. You did? Where were, but you were way far away. Yeah, I heard it. Dennis, can you get, did you get that? We're here to tell your story. Did, it, did everyone hear that? Where I was sitting, I, there, there was something behind me the whole time. I don't know, I can't describe how I feel about this right now. It's a kid. I heard it. It was a kid. It wasn't a cat. It smells weird. I don't smell anything. I smell, it's weird. It's a weird smell, right? Tell me what happened. This little, it was like a, like a, a little girl sound. And then he's like, maybe it's a cat. I'm like, well, let's see if it's a cat. It happened again. And then it stopped, and it was not a cat. And then over here, you could hear like a little sigh, like a little, like, I don't know, same kind of voice. The most interesting, unexplainable phenomena we captured were audio phenomena called EVPs. What was extraordinary about the entire evening was that not only were we hearing uh, sounds that were present uh, as the team was investigating, uh, but we were also capturing EVP on top of that. A, a lot of the investigative crew claimed to have heard a child's voice, uh, people's names being spoken, that seemed to be appearing right next to them. That was not EVP phenomenon. That was physical acoustic sound. What, ha what just happened? I heard a shh. There, there was something behind me the whole time. An EVP, or electronic voice phenomenon, is a sonic anomaly that appears on a recording device that is unheard at the time of the recording. So only in playback do you hear the EVP. Now, there's a, a, a little filament, a plastic filament inside this device with a diaphragm that when sound comes in, when acoustical energy hits the mic, it vibrates this diaphragm and hits this plastic piece, which generates an electrical current, which is sent down into the recording device. That's the physical nature of sound. So when the human ear is translating acoustical energy, it's hearing it at a dynamic range between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. EVP is formed outside of the normal hearing range. However, the sensitivity of the equipment itself can pick up audio frequency information that the human ear cannot. A woman named Sarah Estep from the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomenon, she came up with three classifications for EVP. Class A EVP is clearly understood by anybody who listens to the playback. Class B EVP is something that is obviously human language, intelligible to a certain point, but not as easily translated by a lot of people. A class C EVP is a little bit more hard to discern, but it sounds like it's being generated by something intelligent. On the night of Arnosky Farm, um, there was a part of the investigation that was near a wall that was built by the former slaves. And uh, one of the investigators said, wait, did, did you hear something? So I crouched down with my recording device, uh, planted it in the ground firmly and pointed it back down the trail. After reviewing the tape, 
we caught what I believe would be classified as a class C EVP because what I'm hearing is a woman's voice say Cassie as if she's clarifying what was just spoken. Did you hear? Yes. Cassie. Cassie. The version we just heard was the original source material, just what we recorded. The next version we're going to hear is the uh, noise reduced and a gain increased version. And basically all we've done is stripped out unnecessary frequencies. We're not altering or editing the tape in any way other than to improve the quality of what we're hearing and increase the volume of the actual voice so that the listener can hear it clearly. The child crying. Did like, you hear it? Yes. <laughs> It's usually uh, required that you ask a question first before the EVP response will appear. That response, in my experience, tends to appear within two to three seconds after you ask your question. The theory posited is that the discarnate entity is taking the sound energy that you've created and using that to manipulate frequency somehow to create language. Now, during that process, there's a limited amount of acoustical energy that it can use. Therefore, its responses tend to be very short. So the words that are usually spoken have to be very relevant so that the listener, the, the physical listener, understands that something is interacting with them in an intelligent fashion. The second file that we're gonna be listening to is actually what I would consider a class B EVP. What makes this fascinating is that it's an intelligible sound. It sounds like human language. Let's see what you think. You can say that to us now. I hear the, the voice say, it is the Saint Clair. Saint Clair was a patron saint of the poor. However, a colleague of mine listened to this same EVP and heard something completely different. Here's the noise reduced version. You can say that to us now. Some critics of the EVP phenomenon um, claim that all that you're hearing in some circumstances is what's called RF interference or radio frequency interference. And it's basically the idea that you're picking up a stray radio station that's being translated under your device somehow. Wireless technology has been known to pick up stray RF frequency. So what we use is something called a shielded cable that's attached from the microphone directly to the recording device and that is designed to prevent radio frequency interference from happening. This next EVP is what I would consider a class A EVP. And in my personal opinion, this is the type of EVP that will test your faith. And if there's anything you'd like to say, And here's the noise reduced version of that same class A EVP. If there's anything you'd like to say. After listening to this, I very clearly hear the word master. Now, given the context that we were in, standing next to a wall that was built nearly 150 years ago by freed slaves, I think this is a very powerful word that resonates with a lot of listeners. And that leaves a lot to comprehend as the significance of this. What's really going on? In this circumstance, we're hearing something that's very relevant to the history that we're exploring. What's important to remember is that these squares on a map represent more than just spatial boundaries. These squares represent freedom. By staking their claim, by settling this land, these former slaves were joining together in a community of freedom, casting away everything that they'd been through in their lives and starting new lives, not only for themselves, but for future generations, many of whom still continue to live on this land.
A lot of uh, people will come up to me and say, well, have you captured spirit voices? Have you captured a ghost? And my mind is absolutely baffled by it. But the fact of the matter is, it's on my recording device. It's a kid. I heard it. It was a kid. Like a, a little girl sound. So the spirits that remain aren't necessarily people that stood out. They're regular people who were born here, lived here, died here, and never knew anything else. So in all likelihood, the spirits that remain do so because of their attachment to the land. Special thanks to the Texas General Land Office's Save Texas History program, educating Texans of all ages about our colorful past. Go to SaveTexasHistory.org for more information.